Thank you for your giving faithfully to the work of the Lord here in Yankton through this church. God bless you as you continue to be faithful with your tithes and your offerings. Thank you for the awesome time of worship we just uh, experienced. Uh, those songs were beautiful. Great words of praise and worship in them. I, I trust you didn't, didn't just sing songs, but you let those words form worship in your heart and lifted your heart in praise and worship to the Lord God. I just want to, uh, if you don't, if you're a guest and you haven't met me yet, I'm Ron Traub. I'm the interim pastor. The church is uh, looking forward to a new pastor coming and uh, the board who serve also as the pulpit committee are working and praying and seeking God for God's direction. We invite each of you to join in that prayer, waiting on the Lord to reveal to us his plan for tomorrow, for the future, for this church. We believe that God is already praying, uh, speaking to that one that's supposed to come, preparing them getting them ready for what's going to take place. And so let anticipation grow in your heart for what God is going to do. God gives only good gifts, and he has a gift prepared for you. And uh, as we wait on him, he's going, to, uh, he's going to reveal that to us. Pray for your church leaders, the, the staff, and the uh, board as they continue to wait on God and minister here in this church in this in this time that uh, we wait for a new pastor. Bless you. Good things are happening. Uh, camps are going on. Young people are, are going to camp and meeting with the Lord in a new dimension. And we uh, pray for that to continue. Pray for those camp meetings. Pray for the safety as they travel to and from and as they enjoy the time out in the hills. But most of all, pray that uh, each one that goes to camp <clears throat> comes back with a fresh, with a fresh testimony of what God is doing in their life. Well, turn in your Bibles this morning to James chapter 5. And we're going to use James chapter 5, starting with about verse 13 as uh, our text for today. One of the five pillars <clears throat> of the Islamic faith calls on the Muslim people to pray five times a day. If you've ever visited a Muslim country, Five times a day, you will hear coming from these towers throughout the city, the loudspeakers calling people to pray five times a day. They, uh, once in the early morning, and then at noon, and late afternoon, and sunset, and before they go to bed, five times a day. And, and if a Muslim person is away from that village, that city, that community where the loudspeakers blast that call to prayer. They, they still, on those moments, take time to pray. They will roll out a little piece of carpet. They'll kneel down on their knees and then they'll bend their head to the floor and up and down and they pray five times a day. They'll do it in airports. They'll do it at places of work. They'll do it wherever they find themselves. Five times a day. They will pray. They're called to pray. It's one of the five pillars of their faith. They bow and they face toward Mecca, the home of Mohammed. And five times a day, they'll go through this ritual of praying. It, it, it's quite a unifying ritual for the Muslim people, knowing that all over the world,
Pharaoh let those precise times, the whole congregation of Muslim people go bow and pray facing Mecca. The Jewish people had a tradition that they would do, they would do that three times. The psalm was said he did it seven times a day. Pause in what they're doing to turn to God and pray. When I heard this about the Muslim people and learned this, I could not help thinking of, of, uh, of what I read in the Word of God about Moses and Daniel and Jesus. God, God said of Moses, God said of Moses, God said it. He said that Moses is my friend. And we speak as friends speak face to face. Imagine that. He said, I speak to my friend Moses face to face. Daniel, the Bible tells us, opened his window toward Jerusalem three times every day and he prayed toward Jerusalem. He was in captivity and had been taken in exile to this foreign land, but three times a day he would open his window and toward, toward Jerusalem and pray. Now Jerusalem was where the, the temple of the Israel peoples. And in the temple was the Holy of Holies and they believed that God dwelt in that Holy of Holies. Daniel would face the the temple in Jerusalem. Daniel would face where God was. And three times a day, he would pray. He had, he had met God in that place. And in that place, there was answered prayer. He had the testimony of meeting God there. He knew that God dwelt. And so he would open his windows toward <coughs> Jerusalem. And he would pray. My dad, many years ago, pastoring a little church in the suburbs of Detroit, they had a small little uh, storefront building on, uh, on a piece of land and they had met there and now they had filled that building and needed to build a larger building just across the parking lot. And when the building was complete and the people were supposed to move to that new building, they didn't want to go. This is where they had met God. They had been married in this church. They had dedicated their children in this church. They had, they, had, they, had, they had met God. God had met with them and they had experienced wonderful, awesome experiences in the presence of God. They didn't want to go to that building just across the parking lot. <laughs> we don't like change, do we? We don't like change. We, we, change is awkward for us. We, we, we just want things to stay as they were. But they didn't want to go because it was here that they had met God. They had experienced God's presence. God had answered prayer. Some of them had found Christ as their Savior. They had been filled with the Holy Spirit. Had experienced healings there. They didn't want to leave. I can understand. We ought to have a place where we know we have met with God and in difficult times and stressful times and in emergency times, we can face that place. Now, not literally. We don't have to literally face that place. But we turn our face, we turn our heart to that spot where we have met with God. That's what's important for you to have a prayer closet. Where you can go to. Oh, not necessarily literally a closet, but the scripture called it that. It said, go into your closet and close the door and pray. A place where you know when I go there, I can meet God. You know, if you if you determine I'm going to meet God at a certain time and a certain place every day, I, I, I promise you when you go to that place, you'll experience God's presence. He, he will keep the appointment. He'll meet you there. 
Jesus, it says in John eleven forty one, lifted up his eyes toward heaven and prayed. All of these turned their face toward God. Hebrews 12, 2 calls us to look to Jesus who is the author and the finisher. The author and the finisher of our faith. If you, if you know your Bible, you know that in, in Hebrews chapter 11, in Hebrews chapter 11, that it lists all the heroes of faith. Well, not all the heroes, but many of the heroes of faith. It lists them there. It's the hall of fame of the faithful. And then in chapter 12, it goes on and it says, it, it calls us to look to Jesus who is the author and the finisher. Looking to God. Turn your face toward God. Read with me in James chapter 5. Starting with verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church for them to pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And if he has committed any sins, he'll be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Are you hurting, it says? Are you in trouble? Is there some difficulty? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders to pray. James is saying, turn your face to God and pray in all in all the circumstances of life and whatever you are experiencing currently if you're happy things are going well sing praises to the lord if you're in trouble pray if you're sick call on the elders of the church to pray now certainly <clears throat> Our prayer is different than the Muslim. We don't have a five time a day law. Our physical position is not a fixed one. But there is something to be said to face in the right direction. That is to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus is all I need. Mean. To live our lives facing God in prayer. Don't miss what James is teaching here. No matter the situation, you need to be facing God. Martin Luther said, as it is for the business of tailors to make clothes and for cobblers to make shoes, so it is the business of the Christian to pray. In this, James, in this passage, James highlights several different scenarios when we need to turn our face toward God in prayer. First of all, <clears throat> those in trouble. The word used here, translated trouble, means suffering or tough times. A time maybe when there isn't enough money to pay the bills. 
when the storm blows through and roofs are torn off and trees are blown over, when, when the Bible talks about when, when the foundations crumble beneath your feet, what are you supposed to, what does the saint do? When the foundations begin to crumble, what does the saint do? We pray like we've never prayed before. When your friend is acting like a jerk and destroying your friendship, James says, pray. When the rug is pulled off from under your life, pray. But listen, it doesn't say here that you, that when, say when you are in trouble, pray and God will take the trouble from you. It doesn't say that, it doesn't promise that. In fact, James, in James 1, uh, verses 2 through 4, it, 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 it says that, basically it says that trouble is a part of life. Stuff happens. Even to the saints of God. Even to the praying person. But in the midst of it, we have a choice. We can allow God to use it to shape us into His image. We, we sing about that today. Or we can allow it to destroy us. James is saying we can choose the outcome of our trouble. Think about that. We can choose the outcome of our trouble. Turning to God. Is anyone in trouble? He should pray. Now Paul wanted deliverance. He prayed three times for deliverance. He had what the scripture calls a thorn in his flesh. This thing that was just eating his lunch. Tearing him apart. It was something he couldn't get away from. And, and, and it, it, it troubled him. And so he prayed. He asked God for deliverance. Three times. And three times God said, no. What do you do when God says no? He didn't just say no. He said something very important. He said, I'm not going to deliver you, but I have something better for you than deliverance. What could be better than deliverance? I have something better for you than deliverance. He said, he said to you, my, for you, my grace is always sufficient. And so when you're troubled by this thing, and it's not going away, even though you pray, you, you, it doesn't disappear. God says, my grace for you in those times is always sufficient. And Paul would say later, I learned that it wasn't to, that my strength wasn't found in deliverance, but my strength was found in the grace of God. This thing, whatever it was, caused Paul to pray and to pray and to pray and to seek God's face. And he received each time God's always sufficient grace. And he said, that was my strength. Not in deliverance. But in the grace of God, it caused me to keep it. He said, if I had got delivered, my head would have puffed up for the much revelation I was receiving. God was revealing mysteries to him. God was showing him the heavens. God was working miracles through him. And he said, if I would have been delivered from this thing that caused me to seek his face, that caused me to know that I am weak and I need God, if, I, if he delivered me, I wouldn't have had that thing. I would have been puffed up and pride would have ruined me. It was, it was the grace of God. But I found where I found my strength. That even though there was this thing, God's grace was always sufficient in my life. As we pray, we'll be drawn nearer to God and God will use this trouble to make us into something beautiful. Then he says, are you happy? Sing. <laughs> Worship. We teach our children, hopefully, to say thank you when we receive something from another. But are we in the habit of telling the Lord thank you? 
He's the one who has given us everything that is worthwhile and good. Every good gift comes from Him. It is often this prayer of thanksgiving that we neglect. I trust that all of you are in the habit of bowing your hidden head and say, saying thank you when you're about to eat. I, I, hope, I hope that you do that even when you're with a crowd of people who maybe are not believers. You sit down with them at the lunch table at work, school, and before you, before you begin to eat, you, you bow your head silently and say, thank you, Jesus. I, I watch when I'm in a restaurant, I look around and people sit down and, and it always, it always uh, does my heart good to see someone or maybe a family, a couple, and before they eat, they pray. Suddenly I, I sense God. There's a brother and sister, we, we, and we haven't forgotten to say thank you. The Bible says when you, when you have eaten and your stomachs are full, don't forget to praise the Lord. Don't forget to say thank you. It's not, it's not amazing that when we are in trouble that we pray, but what about when everything is going our way? Does it cause you to worship the Lord? You know, <clears throat> I used to it. I've been a pastor now for over 50 years. And I used to sit on the platform. And they had these big chairs for me to sit in. They looked like a, like a king's throne. <laughs> and when that, once we started getting worship bands like we have here, they just kind of moved me off the stage. They moved my chair over for a while. And, and pretty soon I came in and it wasn't even there. <laughs> I started sitting down there. You know what? I liked it. I liked it sitting down there with the people. I liked it for another reason. When I sat up here, I sometimes got discouraged. Uh, got discouraged early in the service because the church was nearly empty. And then when I started sitting down there and I got up and I looked, oh, the people arrived. How grateful I was that they came. And, uh, but I got discouraged for another reason because I watched you sing songs of praise and about the joy bells flooding your soul. I wondered when the song would hit your face. <laughs> you ever wonder that as you're leading worship? Yeah. Okay, she's not going to come in. <laughs> he says, when you're happy, sing. 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 Worship the Lord. I love to sing. We were, I met my wife at North Central Bible College. And we, uh, one of the first times we were together in a worship service. I was sitting there standing, I think, during that song. And, you know, she's short. And, and she, after about, I don't know if it was the first song or second, she kind of looked up at me and she said, would you not sing so loud? <laughs> I don't sing very good. I love to sing. I mean, I sing good. Just, it's not, not always in tune. <laughs> but I think God thinks I sing good. My mother thought I was going to be a singer like George Beverly Shea or something because in, when I was little in service, when I would sing, sometimes when you weren't supposed to sing, and she thought, I, I'm surely going to be a, a, a famous soloist. <laughs> How long she was. She always laughed at my jokes, too. The other season, I, the other season, I was, I, she was my number one fan. She thought I was going to be a singer. But I love to sing. I love to sing the songs of God, the praises. And sometimes I, one of those songs gets in my, and, and I, I, wherever I'm at, I just start singing in the car. 
sometimes standing in line waiting for the cashier to get to me. And, and, I, and all of a sudden I hear myself and I look around. I'm not a jerk. I'm one of those people that got nuts or something. I was sick of the song. When you're happy, when things are going well, sing. Worship the Lord. Fanny Crosby, the blind songwriter, said, I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. There's a the Christian, the Christian church is known for its singing. Sing, sing, sing. A good friend of mine, Robert Solomon, a good friend of my wife and I, he uh, was born on the streets of Calcutta, India. If you ever been to Calcutta, people live their whole life on the street. They're born there. They live there, they bathe there, they eat there, they sleep there, they die there. He was one of those. That was the destiny. That was what was in, that was all he had. He begged, he, he would go out begging, stealing, looking, hunting, scraping for enough food for that day. His father was an alcoholic. But one day in a drunken stupor, he walked by a church and he heard the music. He heard the singing. And he went in drunk, dirty, living off the streets. He heard the singing. And he went in. And there he heard about Jesus Christ and found the Lord as his Savior and was set free from the bondage of sin and it changed the destiny of Robert Solomon. Robert Solomon was a great singer. He goes around the world singing songs for Jesus. I visited there, that church. His family, his brothers and sisters were all there. No longer living on the street as beggars. They all wore fine clothes, went home to fine homes. They all had great jobs. Their life was changed because a drunk man walking by a street, by a church on the street, heard the singing of the church of Jesus Christ and it changed them forever. This is church. One of the glad things we do in church is we sing the songs of God, but it's not reserved only for the church, only for the church meeting. There should be a song in our hearts that we worship God that we, that we turn our face toward heaven, toward God, and we lift our voice to worship Him wherever we might be. Think of what has happened to you since you came. We, we used to sing an old hymn, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. All oh, the change that has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Think about how your life has been changed, how your relationships have been changed. The change that has happened since you received the free gift of eternal life. Let us sing. James said, let us sing. And then thirdly, he says, and those who are sick, let them call for the elders of the church. Anoint them with oil. Pray the prayer of faith. When there's sickness in the family, it's never a happy time. I remember when I was a boy about, when I was a boy about 
10. I think about 10 years old. Living in the city of Detroit, my father was a pastor and he was away from the, the home. He was visiting another town where he was preaching and ministering in that town. And our mother and my four sisters and I were at home. And it was a Friday night in Detroit. My oldest sister and I had gone, she had a piano lesson and we had to take the city bus to that place and I went along, I don't know why I was there, 10 years old, but I went with my oldest sister for some reason. And when we got to the bus stop coming home that evening, it was dark out and it was lightning and thundering and pouring and my mother came the half mile to the bus stop to pick us up and the, to, to bring us home. And when we got to our porch, I heard the, the, the second oldest sister behind the door and she couldn't open the door. She was holding our baby sister, Donna, two, two years old or less than two years old in her arms and she was saying to my mother outside the door, she's shaking so much I can hardly hold her. Donna was sick. She had a high fever and she was going into convulsions one after another. The electricity was out because of the lightning storm. And my mother finally got the door open and we came in and mother took Donna in the midst of a convulsion. She began to do what she, the only thing she could do, first of all, to pray. And she held Donna and she started to call out on the name of the Lord. And they, they got a hold of a doctor who, who came to the home and, 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 and said to mother, that you're gonna have to get that temperature down. The temperature was well over 100. You're gonna have to get that temperature down. You need to bathe her and bathe her, continually bathe her until that temperature breaks. And that was like six or seven at night. And mother started doing that all the time, praying. And, 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 and I, I, I went into the living room and I stuck my face into the couch of the chair in the living room, uh, to the, the, the seat of the couch, and I stuck my face in there and I began to call out to God. I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years old and I start confessing every sin that a 10 year old boy might have done. And I promised God if he would hear my prayer uh, and, and that my sister would not die. I would never do those again. You ever made those kind of prayers? You're desperate. You're desperate. You're desperate for God to hear you pray. We prayed. Prayed. They got a hold of my father in that church, wherever he was at, outside of town. And he said, I'll be there right after church. And he made his way finally got home about midnight that night. Donald was still having convulsions. I finally went to bed, but I didn't, I didn't go to sleep. I heard my mother and my dad calling out to God that God would hear them and that these, the fever would break and the convulsion. The doctor said, if that doesn't happen, she'll die. About three o'clock in the morning, I heard the tone of, the, of, the, of the, their voices in prayer change. <coughs> They began to thank God. The fever had broken. And Donna would live. Listen, when you're sick, call out to God and pray. When you're, when you're in trouble, pray. When you when you're happy to sing, when you're when you're you're sick, call. Call to God, call for the church to pray. Call for the elders of the church to anoint with oil and pray. There's a plan. You turn, you turn your eyes to God again, your face to God, and you pray. Here James gives this instruction. What to do when you're sick. Notice he says the sick person has a responsibility. As a pastor, it always, sometimes I didn't know somebody was in the hospital until they, until they were home. And I'd get hold of them and say, I heard you were in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. 
Why didn't you call? Well, I didn't want to bother you. You're so busy. Listen, if you're sick, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. To call. To call the church. To call for the elders. You say, well, who are our elders? Well, it's not just the old people. <laughs> a young person can be an elder. Did you know that? Who are your elders? Is the pastor? Is the pastor staff? Is the deacons? Beyond someone in official capacity, any in the church who has some spiritual leadership, either officially or by experience. I hired a lady one time to be on my staff. She was over 70 when I hired her. One day we were having a time of fasting and prayer for the whole, the whole week. We had the church open and people could come and go all day long in the night. They could come and pray. And I was in the, in the sanctuary praying one day and there was one other person there. Her name was Fonda Kavanaugh. Fonda Kavanaugh and her family had been saved in a revival meeting in Sioux City in the 30s. And they were living in the occult. They had seances and witchcraft going on in their home. They heard about this meeting and they went. And they, they actually lived in a little town outside of Sioux City. And that whole, that, that whole town was a kind of a, their family. And, 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 and they were known for this witchcraft going on. But they went to that revival meeting at the Assembly of God Church in Sioux City, and 30, 30 some of them were saved Amen. in that meeting. Fonda was one of them. She was a young girl. Her cousin, Dan Metzer, who did, did the revival time broadcast for a number of years, they, they were saved. Fonda moved to Sioux Falls in, in the 40s with her husband and uh, was part of the church I was pastoring, First Assembly in Sioux Falls. When in that prayer meeting that day, she and I were the only ones there. And as I was praying, God spoke to my heart and reminded me of the, 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 the woman that, that, that Joseph and Mary met in the temple when they took Jesus there a few days old. And there was this woman there. And she, the scripture described her as kind of living there. And, and her, her assignment was to pray. She lived there and she prayed. And Joseph and Mary came in. They brought Jesus to her. And she recognized this was the Messiah. She was a woman of prayer. And as I was praying that day, God said to my heart, I, you ought to have Fonda here praying every day. She was still working at McKinnon Hostel, Avira. McKinnon back then called Avira now. She had worked there for 37 years. She was now only part time. And I, and I walked up to her and I said, Fonda, what do they pay you over there at the hospital? She told me. I said, I'll pay you. Why don't you come work for me at the church? She said, oh, pastor. I would love that. I dreamed of that. I said, I don't really have an assignment for you, but, but I want you just to come and pray. I want you to walk around through the, the building. We have a school, children here every day, daycare and school. There's this, the church staff. And I'd just like to have you come and, and pray. I, I don't have a, an office for you. I don't, have, I don't have a schedule for you. You don't have to show up at any, but I just want you to pray. Would you do that? She said, 
I said, well, listen, don't tell anybody yet because I haven't, I haven't even talked to the board yet. <laughs> board members, you forgive your pastor when he comes up with some of these things. <laughs> some of those are from God. <laughs> I said, I think they'll agree. I went to them and they said, absolutely. When I, a week or so later when I invited Fon to the counter platform, I told them what we were going to do. They, they stood up and gave a standing applause. You see, some elders haven't been elected. They don't have a title. But the church knows who they are. They're people of God. There are people who know how to pray. Some are there by appointment, some are there by election, and some are there because the church knows who they are, that they can pray. You need to know some people that know how to pray. When you need to touch God, you need, and you need someone to pray with you, someone to pray over you, you need to know someone that knows how to pray. Then you can call them and you know they have a direct line that they've established before God. Fonda was one of them. She stayed on my staff. She was the best hire I ever had. She, she started visiting the people in the hospital and the people in the nursing home and the people, you know, the, she, she, she worked harder than Maybe sometimes harder than I was working. She did that until I retired. I said to Vanda, Vanda, you and I are both getting old. It's maybe time for us to. She said, okay, Pastor. You want me to? We, we visited her this past week. She's now 95, 96 years old, still living alone, to, uh, taking care of herself. She doesn't drive anymore. And, and she's a little bit hobbled, uh, but, but she's still, she's still a person that can touch heaven. Call out to God. You see, who are the elders? Well, first of all, it's your pastor, the pastoral staff. You know, they, they are those who have been elected or appointed to certain offices in the church leadership. They're there by office. And then there are those, regardless of age, who you know can touch heaven. You know they live with their face before God, and they can cry out to God. So it says here, if you're sick, call one of them. Call the church. One member in another church asked why the elders were not doing their job prescribed here. The elders were asked and they replied, no one had ever called on them. We encourage you to call on the elders. After they're called upon, Jesus gives them some instruction. They are called to anoint you with oil and they are called to pray the prayer of faith. What does this mean? Well, the anointing with oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The, there are two types of anointing in the Bible. The first was when Samuel anointed David to be king, a setting aside for God's purpose. And they anointed not only the king, they anointed the priest, they anointed everything that was in the temple. They anointed it all. I had a lady, an elder lady in my church, and every once in a while she would come to me with this big bottle of, an, of olive oil. It was a big bottle, not a little tiny, but a big bottle. And she'd come into my office, she would call for an appointment. She'd come to my office, she said, Pastor, I want you to pray over my bottle of oil. I use it to anoint. <laughs> and she would pray, people call her to pray, she would, anoint them with oil, but now she anointed everything in our house. <laughs> I could see her almost pouring that anointing on <laughs> She, she 
wanted to recognize the Holy Spirit. She wanted the Holy Spirit to be active in her life and over her children and her grandchildren and, and her house. Everybody that would walk into her house, they would walk into the anointing. She was setting it aside, separating it for the Lord. And the second was when the Good Samaritan anointed the wounds of the victim a sort of medicine. The words in James 5, the word in James 5 for the anointing is the same word that is used in the Good Samaritan story. Where he anointed the wounds, applied oil to the wounds. Jesus is our healing. He's our healing. He's our healing. A pastor was preaching, and it was altar time. And he saw this, the altar was full of people. Standing, worshiping God. He saw this grandmother coming to him with a, a baby in her arms. And, and she got his attention. And he came down to ask what was needed. And she said, Pastor, would you give my grandbaby Jesus? Are there people around you that are asking for you to give them Jesus? He prayed over that baby. And when we anoint you with oil, we're giving you Jesus. We're turning our face toward Jesus. We're saying, Jesus, we need you now. Jesus, we anoint this one with oil. We need the, we need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to work. Listen, listen. You, you that are the elders that are there by election or appointment, listen to me. You may feel like you're not very anointed at a given time. You, 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 you may feel like, I don't really have anything to pray. I, right now, I, I can hardly pray for myself, much less pray for anybody else. Let me tell you something. As you, as you go in the name of Jesus, you, you as an elected or appointed elder, listen, listen to me. You represent the faith of this whole congregation. The Bible says when two or three will agree together as touching one thing and ask in my name, it'll be done. And you as an elder, as you anoint with oil and you lay your hand on a person and you pray, you are representing the entire congregation uh, in, a, in a greater fashion, not just this congregation, but the whole family of God. You are the two or three together in your prayer, in that anointing. It's an act of faith. It's not talking about your faith or your spirituality or the anointing that you feel upon you. But by faith, you're evoking the promise of the two or three. It's no small thing. You say, Pastor, you know, I didn't live the right way this week. Well, ask Jesus to forgive you. And come with the anointing oil. And pray a prayer of faith. In obedience to the word of God. What God said to the sick person, call on the elder. You've been called. Stand there in faith. God, I'm obedient to you. I'm not worthy of you. There's nothing special about me. But it's the promise of the word of God. And I stand in faith today as I anoint these people and lay hands on them and pray the prayer of faith that you will hear in obedience to your word. We're believing you. We're expecting you to work today. Bless God. Bless God. It's the 
prayer of faith. James says, when you do this, they will be raised up. And if they've committed any sin, they'll be forgiven. Wow. What a bold statement. Well, you may say, Pastor, not everyone is raised up. Well, the truth of the matter is that we are all born terminal. The Bible says, it's appointed unto man death. One day we'll all die. Or be taken in the rapture. James is saying, if you're sick, let us face God and trust Him. Evangelist Tony Campolo, many years ago, Tony Campolo, he was asked to pray for a man dying of cancer. Tony prayed boldly for this man's healing. And a few days later he received, a week later he received a call from the wife who brought him to church saying he died. Tony felt terrible. The wife said, don't feel bad. When he came to church, he was filled with anger and he hated God. He was angry at the all-powerful God who would allow him to die. He would lie in bed and curse God. The more his anger grew, the more miserable he was to everyone around him. But, the wife said, after you prayed for him, peace and joy came over him. And the last three days, were the best days we ever had in our marriage. We sang, we laughed, we read scripture, we prayed. Oh, they were wonderful days. I call to thank you for laying hands on him and praying for his healing. And then Tony said, she said something so profound. She said he wasn't cured but he was healed. Amen. God is in the business of healing. But the only way we'll see his work in our lives is if we spend our days facing him. In our best and worst days, when we're on top of the mountain in the lowest valley, or in the lowest valley, God longs for us to be in fellowship with him. And prayer gives us that opportunity. For some of you to face him, you'll have to turn around. That is, you'll have to repent. You're going in the wrong direction. You're going away from God. You'll have to make a U-turn to face him. Look to Jesus. Pray to him. Repent of your sin. Are you in trouble? Turn your face to God, to Jesus, and pray. He may deliver you, or He may give you His grace to walk in the trouble you're in. His all-sufficient grace. Are you happy? Is everything going good? Sing. Yeah. Sing songs. Praise the Lord. Worship you. Are you sick? Call on the elders. Let them anoint you with oil. And pray the prayer of faith. We're going to do that today. We're going to give you an opportunity. You're not even going to have to get on the phone. We're going to give you an opportunity today to call on the elders. And they're going to pray. They're going to anoint you with oil. And they're going to pray. They're going to pray the prayer of faith. They're going to pray in response and in obedience to the Listen, when you call on the elders, you're submitting yourself to God's word. You're submitting yourself to God's plan. 
You're submitting yourself to this body of believers. You're saying, I have this need. I'm sick. And your word says, I'm, that's why it's good that you, you're in a fellowship. That's why you're good that you came to a, it's good that you came to a church today. Because God has provided a process. And through that process, God shows himself and demonstrates himself. And so today, if you're sick, say, oh, I've had this for a long time, Pastor. I've been prayed for before. I'm okay. I'll, I'll make it. No, that's not what God's Word says. I urge you to submit yourself in faith to God's Word. I don't want to let anybody know. Then they'll ask you what's going on. Humble yourself. God's word, God's plan. I'd like the elders to come. You that are elected or appointed to that official role, you and your spouse come. If you that are with you, come together. Any that have served on this board in the past, I'm inviting you to come. Any of you in this church that you just sensed your role is that you know how to pray. The church would recognize you as that kind of person. I invite you to come stand here with me today. In a moment, we're going to anoint with oil. You say, why? That's, we're going to do it because it's what it says in the Bible. We're going we're gonna to act in obedience and in submission. We have, some, we have some oil bottles here somewhere. I think they're on the platform on the corners there or someplace. Find them and maybe, I don't know if there's enough. If you have to share it with others, that's fine. And now, you that are here today and there's a sickness. Maybe you're really sick today. Or maybe you had or you had a diagnosis by a doctor and, or, or maybe you're just not feeling too good or there is some pain that's bothering you or something. I don't care how long you've had it. I don't care how many times you've been praying for in the past. I'm asking you today to, to respond to the Word of God. To submit yourself in obedience to that. To, to come in faith. To submit yourself to this church. It, it's representatives the church to understand these people here represent you. You are part of them. They're saying, I'm coming to represent this church and the prayers of this church. So when you sit here in this room, you have a responsibility not just to not just to be a spectator, but, but to join your prayers right now in faith with these that are here. And agree, God's gonna move by his spirit. Anyone today that there's something in your body. You're taking medicine for it. You're going to see a doctor for it. And we're not against any of that. I take medicine. I got a, I got a whole box of medicine I take. <laughs> it's keeping me, it's keeping me beautiful. You, you should see me without this medicine. <laughs> but I still believe in the power of prayer. I still ask God to, to heal me and I ask people to pray for me. I'm inviting you to come now. I'm inviting you to come now. And allow these folks to anoint you with oil and to pray over you. Anybody here that needs prayer, there's something going on in your body. Some, you say, well, I know what it is and, and I, I, I can live with it. Well, that's not what God says. You say, come. Call upon the elders. Would you do that? Come in obedience. Come let us pray over you today in the name of Jesus. We're going to pray. We're going to anoint you, Lord. We're going to pray.